Okay, I will just wait for a few seconds so that I'll let the audio get connected. So good evening to all and good morning to Kabir sir and uh, Mansi ma'am. So today we are having a, uh, as part of our international teaching month session, we have a session on key developments to look out in international arbitration. We have Mr. Kabir Dugal and Professor Ms. Uh, Mansi Karul. Uh, so I'll just introduce you, uh, give their brief. Uh, Dr. Kabir Duggal is an attorney in Arnold and Potter's New York office focusing on international investment arbitration, international commercial arbitration, and public international law matters. Serving both as a counsel and arbitrator, Dr. Duggal is a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School, teaching international investment law and arbitration. He is also a course director and faculty member for the Columbia Law School, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, comprehensive course on inter international arbitration. He also acts as a consultant for the United Nations Office of the High Reputation uh, Representative for Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States on the creation of novel investment support program. We also have Professor Ms. Uh, Mansi Karol. She is Director of ADR Services, Commercial Division at American Arbitration Association in New York. She oversees administration of the large commercial complex, uh, complex caseload, user outreach, and panel of commercial neutrals in New York. She is dedicated to promoting alternative dispute resolution methods and services. She is also a founding member of the ADR Inclusion Network Committee to increase the visibility and availability of diverse neutrals promote growth of prospective diverse neutrals and serve as a resource on inclusion and diversity in ADR. So we welcome you both uh, you, in this session, uh, ITM session. So uh, students uh, and faculties, this session is on the uh, topic, key developments to look out in international arbitration. So I request uh, Dr. Kabir and Mansimam to take over the session and uh, share your viewpoints. Over to you, sir. I'm, I'm actually going to pass the proverbial mic first to Mansi. Perhaps, Mansi, you can tell us a little bit about what you do at the AAA ICDR, and then I'll, I'll do a brief introduction and then we delve in. Sure. Uh, thank you, Kabir, and uh, very nice to meet everyone. So, uh, my name is Mansi, and um, I work, I've been working with uh, AAA ICDR uh, for over four years now. It is a not-for-profit. It's a ADR provider, which means that uh, it's like a private court system. We administer large and small um, uh, arbitrations and mediations, and we promote ADR in general. Uh, we are based in the United States and we also have office in Singapore. Our international division has office in Singapore and we have five divisions and we uh, do all sorts of cases at AAA ICDR, uh, be it a commercial case, construction case, international case, labor and employment or uh, insurance. Um, our caseload is really uh, wide. Uh, as I already mentioned, we do over 350,000 to uh, 400,000 cases every year. And uh, generally, we are the largest ADR provider. And as I mentioned, we are a not-for-profit. So our goal is not to uh, make money. Our goal is to basically provide ADR services. So the lag in the code system is, uh, you know, it is not... Uh, so there's no lag in, co uh, in the court system. And um, among uh, other things, we also recruit uh, arbitrators and mediators um, all across US and globally. And um, Professor Dugal is also a part of our uh, commercial roster in New York. And he does both, uh, he serves as a neutral both in international and domestic cases. So for me personally, I administer, I work within the New York uh, branch and 
I work within the commercial division. We have a fairly big office in New York. Our headquarters are in New York, and we also have a regional office where we uh, convey hearings, we host hearings. So at any point, I, if any student happens to be in New York, do visit our offices. We always encourage students to come and see us. And if you need any information, if you have a writing piece, we also run a journal. Uh, you can take a look at the AAA ICDR website. It's quite uh, intuitive. And uh, there's a lot to uh, learn about ADI in general if you're interested in the field, both from uh, domestic and international arena. Uh, so that's a little bit about AAA ICDR. And for me, um, I administer large complex cases. I uh, recruit neutrals and I like to talk to students about ADR in general. Uh, and that's why I'm here today because one of one of our goals at Ripley ICDR is to talk about ADR and um, arbitration in, from uh, all perspectives in general to spread awareness. Uh, so uh, students and lawyers and the society is just aware about the concept. Uh, so now um, I'll turn to Kabir for a brief introduction and then take it from there. Sure. I mean, I just encourage everybody, if you come to New York, you must see the AAA ICDR office. It is in the heart of New York. You can see, I think, how many landmarks form the building. You can see Grand Central now Station. Can see you can see, <laughs> yeah, six landmarks. You can see the now UN, you can see the Chrysler building. It's kind of spectacular and they have free snacks. So if you want to save some dollars, you can have some really great snacks. It's really a very beautiful office. I spend a lot of time there. Mansi's background is actually the kitchen. Uh, just think about it for a moment. They administer 40,000 cases a year. Uh, that is, I mean, you know, there are courts in the world that would administer, not in India, but there are courts on the planet that administer less cases than that. So it is really a spectacular body. Uh, I'm Kabir. I practice arbitration in New York. Uh, as counsel, a lot of my work is in the investor state area. As an arbitrator, a lot of it is in the commercial area. I work very closely with the AAA ICDR, as you just heard about. Uh, if you are aware of what is happening around us, this is a very bad joke. You know, for the past two years, something is happening bad. Something that begins with C that we shall not name and mention, right? And that's what we are going to talk about. How has arbitration changed? How has arbitration modified itself? How has arbitration adjusted to this new reality of COVID? And Mansi, perhaps we start with you, okay? Tell us, how were things done BC? Now, if you're thinking about BC as going yes, back sir. 20 centuries, that's not what we mean. BC before COVID. That's how we are going to think of time. After COVID, before COVID. So tell us, Mansi, how were things before COVID? Sure, thank you, Kabir. Uh, so before COVID, uh, we used to host uh, hearings at our AAA ICDR offices. And not only hearings used to happen in our offices, they used to happen in any any anywhere convenient for clients and where they decide to uh decide to have hearings it's totally the party's process so it's up to them where they want to have the hearings uh we are in we agree to what parties want uh, given that it's a party's process so in international arbitrations before covid there was a lot of paper involved which means a large number of files would be sent from one space to the other. Um, at our AAA ICDR offices in Midtown, we also host international hearings and we have uh, a very big hearing room which can accommodate uh, actually over about 50 people. But right now because of COVID guidelines, we've limited it to 30. So, uh, so we would have law firms come in with 
you know hundreds of binders and their own port, uh, their own computers and their own libraries and they would you know install all that in different rooms and you know just create a code room so besides paper there used to be a lot of technology which was also brought into AAA's offices and beyond if it could be in a hotel a lot of travel involved because obviously in international arbitration all parties and arbitrators are uh, located in different parts of the globe so and um, new york is one of uh, one of the it's a hotbed of international arbitration and a very uh, uh, a venue that everyone agrees to so so pa parties from different part of the world would come to new york or it could be any other part of the world say london singapore any other part of the world so lots of travel um, to coordinate uh, so everyone reaches at one uh, place. Uh, timelines would be crazy because obviously you have to follow everyone's schedule and sometimes there's a lot of delay involved in that because sometimes the arbitrators are not in, uh, available because they have hearings, sometimes you know clients are not available. So largely speaking, when it comes to a international arbitration, uh, from the preliminary hearing, sometimes it could take 18 to 22 months just to decide the date of evidentiary hearings, just because it had to be based on everyone's uh, convenience to meet at one place. And uh, so what really happened is that everyone would win except for client, because obviously as a client, you have to spend a lot of money you have to engage the law firms for over uh you know almost 18 to 20 months you have to keep paying their retainer fee you the arbitrators have an early uh, rate that they would charge only for the time they spend but again you know there's a lot of time involved and it's not it wasn't really a win-win situation of course it was it would still save a lot of time when going to court especially when there are two entities involved but before before COVID, it was um, it was really difficult for uh, everyone to coordinate. But what we've been seeing is things have changed. Lots of uh, lots of people started to adapt, and we started to proceed with international arbitrations uh, via online uh, uh, platforms. Initially, when COVID just hit, what happened was, uh, and I'm talking about March 2020, no one was accepting the fact that, you know, this has happened and, you know, we will have to uh, find other ways to conduct arbitrations, both in international and domestic arbitrations. Uh, so what, what I personally, as a case administrator, saw was that, from March 2020 to May 2020, everyone was just delaying hearings, especially hearings that those were scheduled in that specific period of time. And hearings that were scheduled even in June and July were postponed just because everyone thought that eventually we'll meet in person. But uh, it turned out that this thing wasn't going. And uh, then everybody accepted that, you know, a virtual platform is the way to go. People including arbitrators, counsel, clients, everyone became flexible and adapted to learning, you know, different virtual platforms. It could be Zoom, it could be BlueJeans, it could be WebEx. And uh, eventually it turned out that everyone was very comfortable. At AAA ICDR personally, we have done over 12,000 virtual hearing from March 2020 until now. And these are just cases that we administ administer. They are also external vendors who administer hearings. So there are more cases than that idly that were administered to uh, virtual platforms. Our arbitrators were trained and we saw that everyone learned these platforms very quick, quickly and became very, very flexible. This led to increase in access to justice for everyone, parties, especially because they could be in any part of the world and still, you know, manage to see the hearings. 
a lot of cost involved in travel was eliminated because obviously when you have to travel from uh, one part of the world to the other you have to pay for your transport you have to pay for your hotel you also spend so much on other things or, or you have to also pay your arbitrators for their travel and their hotels that was eliminated but there are also some geographic challenges which were uh, i think if from my perspective people uh, started to compromise because time difference in virtual hearings is a big uh, challenge the and we also know for instance even now it's uh, evening for you all but morning for uh, kabir and me so everyone started to adapt to that some arbitrators were fine uh, you know sitting for hearings a little later than uh, you know what the time slot would be uh, council begin to adjust their you know schedules and eventually everyone you know sort of engage with with each other so it worked everyone schedule i i've seen arbitrations between east coast and west coast which are, instead of starting at 10 o'clock they would start at 1 pm and uh, and late at eastern time so it's convenient for everyone so everyone and everybody can wear pjs below right mansi exactly <laughs> this up below you can be in shorts and pajamas and whatever you want so the this so basically this gave rise to a lot of flexibility and you know the processes became efficient and uh, the reality of virtual that that's the real re- reality of virtual hearings uh everyone now what i see is is very comfortable with the process even though things are getting back to normal a little bit in new york uh and beyond uh some parties are still you know for virtual hearings just for even in domestic cases because uh, in us domestic cases sometimes parties are also uh located in different parts of the us and the travel time and you know uh the flexibility and accessibility is so convenient when it comes to virtual hearings uh that parties prefer virtual hearings than you know uh meeting in person for instance in lots of my cases when i talk about the hearing cycles and especially if parties do not agree to hearing cycles as in new york they say that how does that matter anymore because we don't know if the hearings will be virtual or not and if you know hearings are virtual and then who cares if you know hearing cycles is new york or it's any other venue so uh that's a big uh you know a big compromise that everyone is making but at the same time it is really helping uh cases to move forward at triple a icdr we thought that you know there'll be a pause both system shut down when covid hit but we didn't stop working um uh, our entire company was and you know equipment and we were we were actually working until in the in those two months we we didn't close at all and we came up with the concept of virtual hearings and other institutions not only us we also came up with virtual hearing guidelines which you can see in our uh website which are very very um helpful in managing virtual hearings especially for the arbitrators and council together other institutions have also come up with uh guidelines you don't have to follow them but uh they are great when you when you think about you know uh conducting virtual hearings because there are lots of challenges involved what are the concerns sometimes a witness can be coached we've had inc- incidences where we've heard that the witness and the coach have been uh which means the lawyer has been in the same room while they are testifying and uh and personally like i've spoken to some arbitrators who i work with and they told they, they they have to inform triple a if something like this happens that we felt like the witness was being coached so given that we came up with this concept that when a witness is testifying firstly uh, he or she cannot have a virtual platform secondly they have to have a 360 camera in the room so they can show the tribunal that there is no one else in the room and they are alone and how we figured that the witness was being coached was because the uh, attorney had a similar background because in uh, virtual hearings more or less we do not allow virtual backgrounds 
you have to have your original background you cannot even have a blur background so the arbitrator noticed that the attorney had the similar uh, background as the witness and it was so similar the color of you know the wall was so similar that uh, and there was a little bit of echo that the the tribunal figured that there are two uh, two people in the same room uh so you know things like that can also hinder virtual hearings and that's why we had to come come up with these guidelines and there's nothing wrong in coaching your witness because e- even if you are in a arbitration hearing the attorney and the witness sometimes they are in the same room but at the same time where you know the attorney is uh, directing the witness to answer every question can can be a big concern so that's a big concern in uh, in virtual hearings and we the 360 camera has been helpful uh we also ask the tribunal also asks attorneys and witnesses that if they are in separate rooms or not sometimes they do sometimes they do not because these are really not tools these are just guidelines you have to make sure that you have a good internet connection because that can again really mess up the process in the beginning when we just came up with this concept not everyone had great connections because not every corner of your house has great internet connection again everyone adapted people got you know these small uh my files and stuff like that just in case one internet connection doesn't work you have to come up with other connections then familiarity with uh, with technology zoom bombing and potential hacking was a big factor which had to be brought to uh, which was a concern at triple a icdr we didn't really have any zoom bombing this was a more of a concern in march 2020 from you know i would say in 2020 uh because there were lots of hacking and bombing at that point of time but we told our tribunals and council again in the guidelines that make sure you have a password protected virtual hearing so nobody can hack you and that actually worked so we personally didn't have that issue uh but there was a lot of you know issues of hacking bombing and conflict, which was a big confidentiality issue again so so but there were ways to uh, manage that and a password protected hearing was not hacked of what we in our 12000 hearings none of our hearings was hacked at all but we heard of a lot of um, spaces around even in school where there was a lot of hacking so we always advise clients that make sure and arbitrators make sure every status call that you have every hearing that you have is password protected um in an in a nutshell you know there were due process concerns also but they were also managed uh by the tribunal as you know arbitration is a flexible process uh so every case you know was uh managed which which was convenient for the client and counsel both uh and they came up with their there was there was testing done and it's still continue uh, continuing before every hearing there is a uh, uh there's you know we have these providers who have started to help with virtual hearings because there are several witnesses all across the world and there are too many people so they've come up with you know technology to help and um, there are always test sessions before the hearing day uh and also in the morning uh before the hearing begins for 15 minutes so everyone can hear each other clearly and if there's any concern there's a meeting to contact number so something like that has really helped you know uh in uh conducting hearings through technology and these companies like uh these companies who have been helping with virtual hearings especially in international arbitrations have been really really effective veritex is one example which is being used a lot in uh international arbitrations and domestic arbitrations and there are also others now i'll just turn to kabi to talk about you know uh some uh, some threat certain claims and so on 
Sure, Mansi. Thank you very much. One question for you, Mansi, before we move on. You know, you started off telling us how everything happened over paper, right? Paper was the key point. Is there any sure. development you may want to share in that regard? Sure. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So I wanted to share about this campaign. It's called the Campaign for Greener Arbitration. It started in 2019. The leader is on the steering committee of uh, this campaign. And the goal of this campaign is to, you know, uh, use technology and uh, avoid using any sort of paper. Lucy Greenwood is the founder of this uh, uh, this initiative. So do look at this. Uh, uh, do look at their website and you know the steering committee members. It's a it's it's a really good cause, and uh, to avoid you know paper and to use more technology when it comes to um, international arbitration. So this is one campaign that I would like to share about, and um, and it, I think this will grow as you know, as we are over the years, because especially after COVID, what we've been seeing is that initially everyone thought that uh, uh, virtual hearing is not even possible, even our in, in our international arbitrations, our witnesses used to fly for just thirty minutes of you know, uh, test if they had to fly, uh, if they had to testify for 30 minutes uh, and they would fly from, you know, overseas a 10 hour or a 12 hour flight and then they would testify for 30 minutes and go back. But now, given the technology and, you know, uh, everyone's acceptance to use the technology, things have changed so much. It's just so helpful to, you know, uh, just do it over, uh, over Zoom or over any other platform. In fact, even if you look at our domestic commercial rules and international rules, they both agree to virtual hearings. We do have that. So when you know this, uh, when COVID hit, uh, it wasn't that our rules were not, they didn't agree to virtual hearings, but again, parties have to agree to that as well, which was a little bit of a challenge, but then what could anyone do given the current world everyone had to accept that this is the way to move on we are doing this. everyone is studying right now using the same sort of platform so so that's the new normal at least you know for some some time and we feel like this will continue but we cannot really say maybe yes maybe no time will tell just one point on what Mansi just mentioned, right? The Greener Arbitrations did a study and they came up with a very troubling statistic. They say that a mid-size arbitration, so not large, not the cases that Mansi deals with, but a mid-size arbitration roughly involves 20,000 trays. There's that much paper used. For people who have visited New York, this will make sense. But even if you haven't visited New York, everybody has seen American television. So this will still be familiar. 20,000 trees is entire Central Park in New York City. So one arbitration destroys Central Park. Just think about that for a moment. So Greener Arbitrations is trying to tell us, let's try to do things without relying so much on paper. Just think about this for a minute, right? If you have three arbitrators, and let's not kid ourselves, they're often going to be from the global north. So somebody is from Canada, somebody is from Australia, somebody is from Switzerland, okay? These are your arbitrators. They have to come to New York for the hearing. One party is from India, one party is from Nigeria. They have to come to New York, right? The witnesses are spread all over the world. Stop doing the math on a piece of paper, just combining travel time from each of these countries to come to New York, expenses for food, expenses for travel, expenses for your per diem, right? Stop doing the math. And you're going to really see how the process itself can become expensive, right? Put the dispute aside, the process itself will have a huge expense. 
So virtual hearings have significance. Having said that, let's think about what the broader implications of this can be. And we're going to start with investor state arbitration because we have more publicly available data, right? Now, you have already attended a few sessions on investor state arbitration. You should know what it is. If you don't, in a minute, and this is truly the most simplified definition that you can get, investment arbitration is arbitration arising out of state action, right? Capital S state, country, a country adopts a measure, the measure affects foreign investment, and the foreign investor brings an arbitration against the state, right? Is this something you are all familiar with just as a concept? For whoever is on video, put your thumbs up just so I know that this made sense to you. People, come on. Okay, good. I see one hand going up, two hands going up. Both of you, two women, so that's a good sign. Uh, we're seeing women <laughs> taking over the world and that we always support. <laughs> I think you're a representative of your broader community. So just get the idea here. This is an arb three women. Okay, go women. Uh, this is arbitration involving a state because of state action. Now let's pause here for a minute. What is a key factor about COVID prevention? State action, right? How are we preventing COVID? Governments putting restrictions on what you can do, right? Remember, lockdowns were imposed, uh, restrictions on when you can go out, restrictions on what you can do. All of that is state action. Now, if that state action impacts your business, does a foreigner have a claim? That becomes the question. And here we begin with, just this should be familiar to you for investment arbitration. We have about 3,000 treaties that give rise to this arbitration, right? I'm not going to delve very deep into that because, you know, this, that is not the purpose, but just get the idea. It is state action that results in an arbitration. Can you have state restrictions giving rise to claims? Well, we're seeing threatened claims. In the case of Peru, right? Peru told everyone, go home, right? This was a standard thing that a lot of countries did. Now, when you have to go home, you have to use bridges. Some of these bridges were private and the government wants people to go home. So the government tells the bridges, you cannot charge tolls, right? If your business is charging tolls, this is pretty awful. What do you do? Question for you all to think about. If those foreign investors have treaties against Peru, can they bring a case? And I put a rhetorical question, should they bring a case? Now you think about the latter, there's a legal question and there's a moral question. Both are significant, right? We're also seeing that in cases like Mexico, right? So Mexico had given very great benefits to companies that were going to give renewable energy, okay? So there's all these companies foreign companies operating in Mexico that dealt with renewable energy. In light of the pandemic, the government suspends these benefits. Do these companies have a right against Mexico using investment arbitration? Something for you to think about. Now we just complicate the story a little more here. Apparently, the Mexican government was not a very big fan of these companies to begin with. 
राइट इस कोविड नाउ पोटेंशियली अ प्रीटेक्स्ट टू अचीव समथिंग यू ऑलवेज वांटेड टू अकॉम्प्लिश वुड दैट चेंज एनीथिंग could it be a little bit of both you really look at the pandemic you look at the implications on your budget as well as the fact you don't like them what do you do in that case these are big and meta questions for us to think about this is going to be the new frontier for investment arbitration now mansi mentioned in march 2 2020 when covid started honestly i remember people talking oh in june july everything's going to be fine remember those days <laughs> oh this is going to be a few weeks a few months ah we just stay in for a few days you know for a lot of people especially people you know for middle class families this became like a staycation we should never forget our relative privilege because for so many people this was so much suffering but for us ah two months we stay at home we netflix and chill covid will go away boy were we wrong about that okay it's still it's still ongoing for us in the us next month it will be two years and we are nowhere close to being back to normal i think it's the same in india you know i think india probably has been a little more resilient but we are nowhere close to normalcy right we still not seen the real legal implications of covid the government is still putting things sort of on life support it's really when things start getting better that legal things are going to start getting worse because the life support will be taken off and we are likely going to see a very severe proliferation of all these cases that we have still not seen what does this mean this means for all of you it is a great time to be alive okay i'm not kidding there's going to be a lot of disputes a lot of disputes means a lot of work and it's all of you that are going to have to deal with it so yay just want to highlight in addition to all these potential claims this is something mansi mentioned okay can we see challenges to arbitration on grounds that virtual hearings violated a party's due process rights right now arbitration is an autonomous process but what is the big safeguard we're going to make sure you a party had a full opportunity to be heard a full opportunity to present your case so vishaka if you are involved in an arbitration against saloni we want to make sure that i as the arbitrator i'm not biased i don't like saloni and dislike you for whatever reason you're a gandhi i don't like gandhi right we can't do that your surname is the father of the nation who we all respect so that was a bad example but i'm just giving an example here generally right you get the point right you get the point that we want to make sure the process is fair the process allows both of you to present your case right as you know we don't allow too many challenges now this is issues we have seen in arbitration the case you have in front of you is a case from the early days of covid so it may seem a little ridiculous right now but remember march 2020 we thought everything was going to end in july 2020 we were that stupid <laughs> so it was a different reality that we were operating under the who you have a party representing a country the country is bolivia and there is an arbitration schedule and council comes forth saying there's a lockdown we can't travel to visit our client we are not able to get documents right getting documents from states getting documents is generally difficult but getting documents from a country ha 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 any country even the most organized one good luck okay 
Ki ye for efficiency. Right? They come forth arguing, therefore, we're not able to prepare our case. The hearing should be suspended. Okay? And they're linking it to the due process concerns, the right to be heard, the right to prepare your case. Those are the arguments being made. Okay? Remember, this is an early case. So what does the tribunal tell us? The tribunal tells us, well, I'm going to paraphrase, too bad, so sad, but improvise and get your act together. That's not what the tribunal said. I am paraphrasing what the tribunal said. But the tribunal says, look, this is very sad. This is a new reality. But we have to learn to adapt. Okay? And this is something we'd just like to present to all of you. This is particularly significant for you as young, young lawyers. Young lawyers in the making. Be flexible. Be willing to learn. It will take you very far in life. It is harder for me. I'm in a different generation from you. We are more used to doing things a particular way. It's more difficult for people even above us who have worked with paper all their life. Suddenly you tell them, read a 300-page document online. That's hard. It's just not how you were trained. Right? But for all of you, Embrace technology, embrace these new ways of doing things, because if you don't embrace them, you are going to die. I don't mean really, I mean, you're going to professionally suffer. They're going to be setbacks for you, right? So embrace these realities and things will be better for you. I just put a final note here before I pass it back to Mansi. We are seeing very severe calls from key bodies to restrict arbitration, right? You see this particularly in the investor state context, this body that's affiliated with the Columbia Law School where I teach actually put forth a public statement saying, hey, there's a major pandemic. What should states be thinking about? States should be thinking about the well-being of the people. What should the Indian government be thinking about? Indian people, right? The government should not be thinking about arbitrations. So we want a moratorium on investment arbitration. Okay? There are inklings of this even in commercial arbitration. Right? You had a presentation a few days ago on force majeure. If you're looking at supply chains, it is a disaster. Just to give you a personal example, I ordered a couch, a sofa in September 2021. It is going to reach me in June 2022. I am going to go for virtually a year without a couch. That's awful. We're used to living in a world where if I want something, I go to Amazon, I click next day delivery. The fact that you have to wait for eight months, nine months is shocking. But this is the reality. All our equipments, all, especially for things like your phone, for your computer, all these products supply chains are affected and you are not going to be able to get parts necessary to make products, right? When you're going to have such severe issues, if we're going to start having <coughs> lots of arbitrations, we're gonna have, as you have probably realized, force majeure, the standard is super high, right? If you're going to start having too many claims, what is that going to mean for business? You can see the other side of the argument too, you know, the company that entered the contract, what did we do wrong? We entered into the contract, everyone knew COVID. It's going to be a tough reality. These are some issues we have to confront. It's a great moment to be alive. Mansi, let me pass it to you for the last five, I think we have four minutes 
but perhaps you can quickly tell the students how to succeed. Of course, thank you so much, Kabir. So, uh, I already, you know, sort of covered certain uh, certain aspects on success of ODR or you know what you're hearing, uh, which included, you know, make sure you have a good internet connection, you test your equipment. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, there are companies who help you with virtual hearing. So you have access to, you know, you make sure you have your list in front of you just in case, you know, you're testifying or, you know, you are uh, questioning a witness. Just in case something happens, you can call tech support immediately. So you have all the phone numbers on in front of you. Uh, there are, you have a backup option just in case the internet goes because of electricity. For instance, there was a snowstorm in New York yesterday. Uh, in suburbs, sometimes, uh, you know, there's a lot of disruption. You have some sort of a backup internet option. And what we are seeing is now everyone is much more prepared, including the arbitrators. Um, everyone is really prepared. Like I remember last year in one of my hearings, uh, Parties were located in, uh, the hearing was in Texas, my apologies, and parties were located in different parts of the US. And one of the arbitrators was actually going to the law firm's office uh, to uh, for the hearing because uh, there was a big storm cyclone there and all his internet equipment was um, uh, not, it was just not working. So she was actually going to the law one of one of the law firms and uh, they helped her with uh, getting access to uh, internet and hearings. So you know you have to really work around these things. So there's not a so hearings are not rescheduled. You work around your schedule a little bit and uh, anticipate such issues because like you know flights could be delayed when it comes to in person hearings. These are certain issues that have to be taken into consideration and make sure uh, just in case something like this happens you uh, you have a backup plan and um, i wanted to add that also in virtual uh, media there's a lot of opportunity for uh, diversity because you can have arbitrators and mediators helping you with international arbitration and mediation in any part of the world. So take advantage of that, uh, you know, just to help uh, each other and to make sure that there is also uh, diversity. Uh, div diversity is an important factor, for instance. Um, and this is the charm of virtual hearings right now. What we are seeing is most clients are asking for our uh, you know, we have a link uh, which has access to all our neutrals and they're asking for that so they can look at uh, backgrounds of all arbitrators and mediators and they don't really care about their geographic location, which is increasing diversity in many ways. Sometimes a young arbitrator could get an opportunity to sit on a very uh, complex arbitration. Sometimes uh, a diverse person in located at a specific geographic region, region, not New York, because New York has a lot of opportunity. But uh, in some parts of the US also, not every arbitrator gets opportunity. A woman arbitrator sitting in, say, Alaska can get the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, arbitrate. So uh, definitely, you know, virtual hearings is helping increase diversity in certain, certain ways as well. And uh, virtual backgrounds, as I already said, our uh, virtual hearing guidelines are totally against uh, using virtual backgrounds. Uh, for arbitrators, yes, if they want to use virtual backgrounds, that's fine. But for others, uh, more or less, uh, council and parties both are not using virtual backgrounds. What you can do is you can use a blur image uh, just in case you don't, you know, because obviously everyone understands you may not have a right background to sit. So, which can help you sort of blur your background. Um, I also want to touch base on what future looks like. Uh, everyone is trying to come up with, 
different aspects. Some feel like uh, in-person hearings will come back to normal. Uh, I've had some cases where in-person hearings have happened and both parties and the tribunal or the arbitrator are extremely happy. They're like, oh my God, it was so great to see everyone in person, being in the same room not to worry about technology. It was so, so, so good. And especially now after two, two and a half years, everyone is just so happy about the fact that they could, you know, come into a different space rather than sitting at their home with the same equipment, which had become very monotonous and boring. But at the same time, what we are seeing, especially, you know, when it comes to international arbitration, there are a lot of uh, parties involved from different parts of even US, uh, hybrid is the way to go, which means that some some parties can be in person. For instance, if there are parties in New York, uh, it may be more convenient for them to just meet in person. Whereas if you know some are located on the West Coast, say California, or even in another country, it may be more convenient for them just to you know appear virtually, and that's what we are predicting. At our AAA ICDR offices, we have come up with uh, hybrid technology where there are 360 rotating cameras, we have big screens, and all this development has happened over the last two years, given that we, we, we uh, forecasted that this would be the new normal going forward. And that technology is being used to a certain degree. Uh, parties and tribunal are making the most out of it. Uh, so what I, uh, we forecast is hybrid would be the new way to go where not everyone uh, in the hearing would be present in the same, uh, same room all the time, which would also eventually lead to a more efficient and economical arbitration hearing because you'll save money, you'll save time, uh, Heavy, uh, uh, heavy invoices of, uh, you know, law firms would would law firms cannot would not be able to charge that much, and um, there's a very fixed cost of the arbitrator, which is their hourly rate, which is only five percent of the total arbitration. So in all, it will be a win-win situation. And now I turn to Kabir on his uh, his uh, overview of what future looks like. Not much to add to what you said, Mansi. I know we have six minutes, so we can perhaps take a few questions. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Kabir. Thank you, Mansi. And uh, thank you, Mansi, for telling that what are the real uh, like problems of pros and cons of virtual uh, arbitration. So we have a very sad situation for uh, COVID, but COVID has taught us certain lessons, certain lessons which the world should learn in the era of sustainable development. So what really sustainable development is, what steps we should take, I think people are learning, we are learning slowly through the efforts what we are doing and a very big thumbs up for the number what you are giving that AAA ICDR is resolving around 40,000 cases, arbitration matters, that is a really very big number and conducting 12,000 virtual hearings from March 20, that is a really very good number. I think uh, uh, we should learn from this particular thing. And uh, I would like to also thank you for extending the invitation to visit AAA ICDR. I hope a few of our students or a few of our faculty will soon in near future will visit that particular center. Now, I wanted to have certain questions, ask certain questions, but before me asking, you have answered these particular questions. And those questions were that what role that uh, this ADI is going to play for sustainable development, SDG. I think the answer is already in your uh, introduction. Then uh, what is the role of technology? That is also answered. But one pertinent question which comes to me is that, see, out of this 40,000 decided matters, how about the publication of the awards? Because there is a lot of learning from publishing the awards and the proceedings. So like judgments yeah, so are, yeah. We don't, so, uh, sorry, I just want to correct. We do over 350,000 to 4,000 cases a year. Uh, yeah. So that's a very, very large number uh, because we are a big, we are a big company. We have over 600 yeah. employees 
and we have over 200 case administrators all over the us and you know uh, some um, overseas as well so uh, given that uh, the number is really large the amount of cases we do um, as you know arbitration is a confidential process so not awards are not published in some of our labor and employment uh, cases awards are published we uh, give uh, we did that information and you know uh, bloomberg and uh, lexis nexus and Westlaw come up to us and they um, ask for awards, uh, but all pertinent information is redacted and uh, they publish awards, which, you know, sometimes, you know, people can also make out which arbitrator has written the award because they have similar way of writing the award. So, uh, so you can make out because there are certain, you know, uh, labor and employment arbitrators who are very well known in the community and you know as soon as you read the award you get to know okay this arbitrator has written this award but uh, when it comes to commercial or international or construction awards they are not uh, they are not published because again as i mentioned it's a private and confidential process and uh, we have never published yeah. we have we, we, we don't publish awards or we don't allow companies to publish awards. Uh, my second question is that how do like arbitrators regulate the unconscious biases? Certain so, when it comes to that, there's a lot of uh, training that is provided to arbitrators before, uh, you know, uh, so it's not, so just to, you know, uh, get recruited on <coughs> AAA's panel, uh, there is a lot of um, you, uh, but an individual needs to have at least 10 years of experience in ADR field. Uh, and after that, uh, have some expertise and, and many other things that are taken, taken into account, uh, references. When it comes to bios, uh, we do a core training uh, a, before you join the panel where you know all these kind of things uh, are dealt with which also includes unconscious bias which means you know <clears throat> you cannot you cannot like you know sort of implicit bias training when there are several trainings that arbitrators go through uh, before an arbitrator is appointed on a case they have to exe execute certain documents uh, notice of appointment and compensation where you know there are certain questions that they have to answer and only if parties I mean this is not really related to unconscious bias but why I'm mentioning is that we are uh, we make sure that there are no issues like this arise there are no conflicts arise in the future when our arbitrators appointed and generally we don't really see unconscious bias all our neutrals are real neutrals. Uh, and um, there's a lot of, when we recruit our neutrals, there's a lot of background check that is done. So we've never heard of an issue of unconscious bias. Yes, we have heard of issues like conflicts, which may happen because a parties and arbitrators met somebody or worked in the past, or it could be anything else. And to deal with that, we always tell our arbitrators, make sure, uh, you disclose everything. Uh, make sure you disclose just in case you know you get to know about a witness in the middle of uh, in the middle of hearing. Disclose that just in case you get to know that you worked with some counsel. Disclose that. So as a institution, we make sure that the process is going very very uh, you know very very because we believe in a transparent process so it's going really well and things like this don't affect the arbitration uh, thank you mansi so we have uh, i have other questions also but uh, i would like to take questions from our faculties there's first question to mr kabir uh, from uh, one of our faculty taruna jakar now the question is what is your opinion on establishment of appellate board for international investment treaty arbitrations 
look creating an investment appellate body doesn't seem like a bad idea if our problem is inconsistent jurisprudence you know for any of these questions you need to first identify the problem and then see whether the solution matches the problem if we are identifying the problem as inconsistent jurisprudence having an appellate body will create a jurisprudence if your problem though is that standards in investment arbitration are imprecise and they don't reflect what the states had intended that problem will likely not get addressed by an appellate body the problem is with the standard you need to draft better standards so it truly will boil down to what you consider to be the problem and that will inform you whether or not you think it is a good idea uh thank you uh then there is another question by another faculty that is aditi vyas the question is how have enforcement of awards passed during the pandemic through odr work was that a success while most of the indian courts were choosing to take up only urgent matters have other court systems suffered to uh mansi me answer it sure so the court systems even in the us they shut down for the time period when you know there was a proper lockdown but at triple a we didn't have we didn't shut down we kept running and uh, so it's not like there was a lot of backlog in the us as well uh when it came to you know court system If, when it comes to arbitration awards uh the process was going smoothly and you know there was there were no challenges we never have like we never had a issue like that in fact uh, this is out of context but we also help court systems uh with backlog to a certain degree for instance uh, we did a uh, 40 billion um uh, mediation uh, for uh, the the amount uh the dollar amount involved was 40 billion and um uh, my boss chef um he actually conducted that mediation in that lockdown period because there was a judge from texas who contacted triple a to see if we can help in the next 6 months because it was a very big mediation with 40 parties or 50 parties involved all across the us and the case really had to get resolved uh but um what i mean at triple a icdr we provided with virtual hearing services and managed the mediation so given that uh, the court system there was there was a backlog here as well but as a provider we didn't shut down yeah, uh, i think the uh, bir has to the uh, bir has to uh, log off because yeah. uh, he has a commitment yes yeah. yeah, uh, so, uh, so i was wondering if, yes yes sir uh, and me to in 5 minutes because uh, i have a call at 9:30 i'm so sorry about that uh, so if there are any other questions we we could take them via email or you know uh, yeah. uh, we could uh, we could connect again sometime yeah. uh thank you very much thank you mansi thank you kabir uh, for such a nice interaction and giving the meaning of the term vc and ac before covid and after covid now i think uh, we will see the issues what you are identifying post covid implications we will be waiting and i think i hope our students will be ready for those to tackle with such kind of situation thank you very much for interacting and kindly providing this kind of uh, information in a very lucid manner so um it's a good morning for you i i hope uh, your work is about to begin and we are about to close so i thank on behalf of the institute uh to convey my whole heart whole hearted regards and uh, i would like to give my to my director ma'am and shreya shivastu thank you so much uh, anand sir for uh, giving me this opportunity thank you so much for such a nice session uh, 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 dr kabir and mansi and uh, uh, you have dealt with the issues related to the you know, virtual uh, you can say uh, did, virtually dealing with this arbitration matter and uh, some of the issues are such like uh, maintaining the 
security confidentiality and again uh, working in this virtual uh, on a virtual platform there are many such issues and technology challenges may be there but uh, the number of uh, matters that you have uh, like whatever you have re revealed that uh, such a huge number that's really amazing and i i like i i, I can see that uh, we were working uh, uh, in a in a different uh, setup before covid now we are well versed with the technology and now again post pandemic we have to see what other challenges we will be facing because now we have learned to work in such an environment so it has its own advantages and uh, particularly in our field we can see <laughs> because a lot of traveling and others can be saved. So very happy to interact with you and we look forward to you for more such interaction. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Chairman. Thank, thank you, Professor Google. Thank you, Mansi. It's been very informative and we'll be in touch for our other collaborations also, hopefully. So it, it was a pleasure uh, listening to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Have thank a good day. Thank you, Faculty. Thank you. Stay penalty. Bye.